Now I spoke to Barham about a few years after you'd moved you'd moved to Hove, I think. Yeah. There was this jackhammer incident where Oh, every so time we hired a car to go off for one of these endless trials and preliminary hearings and preliminary hearings and preliminary hearings. Uh -huh. Every time there was an incident. This time we were driving from Hove towards Cardiff. And um, there was two cars in front of us. We'd hired a car and we're, we're driving out of Brighton onto the main road. It's, it's a highway and it becomes a motorway. Just on a, mo on a motorway? On a, motorway on, the, on, a, on a major motorway. Major Probably the M4 motorway. then. I think it was maybe have been the M4, one right, of the major okay. ones. And the heavy, heavy traffic. It's two lanes. And we're on the inside lane. There was a little red mini in front of us and behind it, inside a rusted red van. But it was also strategically placed. It was no, it was, it was no fields, it was stone. Uh, there's a sloping area on this side of the road, you know, you need mm -hmm. side. And uh, the mini went, phew, shot out sideways into the outer lane. And as they did, the doors of the van opened and the jackhammer came out. Alan witnessed two men in crouched positions in the back of the van immediately after the van doors opened. A transit van, the door opened and a jackhammer literally fell out in the middle of the road and got jammed in the, in, in the engine of the car we were driving. So you drove straight into this jack jackhammer and you're on the motorway, right? Well, the jackhammer's way over the hundredweight, and we went straight up, up and over it. And it ripped the sump out of the car. Hell of a mess. Right. But I didn't swerve to the left or right. I thought, you know, just hold it, hold it, stay on. It wrecked the car. Mm -hmm. Well, then we wouldn't have arrived at the court case, mm -hmm. you see. The doors came open um, strategically. It wasn't actually done either. done slowly in, in case of any right. wind. Did you see anyone in the back of the van? Uh, no, oh, right. nothing at all. It's so just a jackhammer fell out and, 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 and we went straight into the jackhammer and the sparks everywhere. I remember the sparks flying behind the mm -hmm. car. Right. Literally, like, like, like a spark. Could that not just be been an accident, Sparkle. Baron? Not in a million years. Nine times out of ten, most people would have instinctively turned the wheel mm -hmm. to avoid the jackhammer. Mm -hmm. Which means that if you instinctively turn the wheel at 70 or 75 miles an hour, the car would spin. It would, there would be an accident. Mm -hmm. But instead of that, he's just st stuck. He's kept it still, the wheel, and continued straight on. Right. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. Another time, and the car, the tire went right down. Right. And there was a big nail in it. Mm -hmm. But when we got it back to the house, there was a remains, a split remains, with a hole had been, uh, of a triangular piece of wood. Right. And they put the nail in like that, put it under the wheel, and it would have gone in. Right. So that's two. Of it. But they, every time we hired a car, they got right. wrecked. So uh, what I did after that, there was a place near to us with hired vans mm -hmm. of all sizes. So I'd go along there at 8 o'clock and they'd have a van on the road about a quarter past. Right. The other, when you hire a car, they want your credit card number a week in advance and all this to hire the car. Well, whoever can track on credit cards could track, check that you had hired a car mm -hmm. at a certain date. You follow me? Mm -hmm. And they know you're going to court in Bristol, miles away. Mm -hmm. And so I go on. We decided to start publishing again in 2004. Mm -hmm. So now we published um, The King Arthur Conspiracy. Mm -hmm. But we did it under the name of Grant Barclay. We got him to stand out in front for us as an editor, mm -hmm. right? Actually, all he's doing is preventing people knowing we're publishing. Yeah. You follow? Mm -hmm. It went to the uh, crew office of the company and then to Canada for publishing. Now, that then gives the copyright and publishing rights in Britain completely free. Right. And they're free anyway, but it gives me a little barriers. Right. And that went through. Next year, we, we published the next book, which was the uh, Moses in the Hieroglyphs. Mm -hmm. They were waiting for us. Because after seven weeks, I'd heard nothing. Now, usually there's a minor query about that and a couple of minor queries about this before they send it off, you see. Mm -hmm. It gets printed in Canada. Um, but nothing. So I phoned up and I couldn't get sense, you know. Mm -hmm. So on the spur of the moment, I looked up and I phoned Victoria, Canada, mm -hmm. and I said, can you tell me the progress on this book? Mm -hmm. uh, what's your name? They said, well, we don't never heard a word of it. There is no such book. I said, well, I've sent you the check. You've had your check in the sort of the check number. It's gone the, what's your mate, Alan? Yeah. It was yeah, gone well. off in the right period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got a title of the book and da, da, da. I said, no, I've not heard one of the slightest query, which is damned odd with a book, like, you know. I said, yeah, well, they said, can we bring you back? I said, yeah. So they rang me back and they said, look, don't do anything, right? We will be in touch, don't do anything. 
Well, that day then they put two people on a plane from Canada and they were over in the crew where the office was. And they got there, I don't know about the hours, how we did it, no, but they got there before the office closed and they searched the one office of three offices. Mm -hmm. They went to a hotel for the night, came back next morning, they thought, we'll search the same room again, just in case, and we'll go back. And there, in a locked big steel cabinet, on a shelf that had been emptied the day before, was the book and everything, all the stuff that should have been sent to Canada. Mm -hmm. It turned out that the woman in charge, an Oxford graduate, her husband had been approached by an MI5 man, mm -hmm. who we know, and he is MI5, and this guy had talked to this guy, uh -huh. and then the wife had taken the stuff and hidden them in the loft of her house. So this is preventing, preventing the, the source material getting to the pub, the printer. Well, that... all the illustrations, all the text, right. and, and the uh, DVD of the right. text, and and there was another case where you. So they you... then shut the crew office, sacked everybody, and right. opened the office up in Oxford. Right. But fairly quietly, actually. So the third book then we did. Um, which would be Discovery of the Ark. That was it went to Oxford, and that went through reasonably well. Right? Right. But the fourth book, they discovered again, and we, we, we moved, you know, we shifted our, mm -hmm. our focus, and uh, they, uh, well, it got lost. It got mixed up with another book, right. and uh, there were two books entangled. Then they couldn't find it anywhere. Then it was out in Victoria, then it wasn't. So I got the Thames Valley Police on it. Well, they said, we can't do a lot, really, if it's out in Canada or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but they said, we'll, have a, we'll do what we can. We'll, yeah. we'll, we, we've got a few friends out there. You know, I said, do you get the FBI? They said, well, we, we'll see what we do. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we tracked it from Victoria in Canada to Oregon, and from Oregon down to Bloomington, Ohio, Indiana. Mm -hmm. And we finally got it printed anyway. Now, tell me about the holiday in Malaga in 2004, Alan. <laughs> Weird. Uh, we had a habit of taking winter breaks. A, it's cheaper, and we don't socialise that much, right? You know. Got someone to look after the house. And um, we went up to Malaga. Well, f first thing we found, we weren't in going to the hotel we were supposed to go to. We were going to a different hotel. Mm -hmm. They had been switched. Well, it wasn't worrying us. The first thing when we found that the, you know, we were inf informed that we weren't going to a three star hotel, we were going to go to a five star hotel. Mm -hmm. I didn't like that. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't believe in uh, gifts, uh, Greek, Greek sparing gifts. It was one of these hotels with an office centre and then there's a sort of centre for the meals and the entertainments and then streets of little cottages, mm -hmm. uh, often three to join together or two joined together, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we were in this little street of cottages, right on, the, the hotel was about a quarter full, but we were on a, a cottage right on the other side, like, you know? Right. Didn't worry so much. And behind our cottage was a lane going like that, you know, the yeah. car park, and it curved down and down to the beach. But you couldn't get out to, to our cottage, street, but the next door one you could, had a window to go open it, but we, our windows were that way. We were manoeuvring into the chalet, mm -hmm. it's a chalet outside the hotel, because it said the hotel was full, which wasn't true, because it was about 17 vacant rooms, I checked it out. Mm -hmm. I noticed uh, there was a guy in, in the bar in front of me, right? biggish man, as tall as you, but mm. make you look like skinny, you know, big. Very large man, must have been about 18 stone, made me feel like a shrimp. He was whacking big guy. Mm. <laughs> and uh, he had a Welsh accent. He was obviously very, very fit, mm. like at least a rugby player. Mm. And I thought, Swansea Valley, something like that, you know. Mm. So he didn't say, so I spoke to him when he was, how are you doing? Uh, and he said he spoke, but he obviously didn't, not usual Welsh reaction, he didn't want to be friends at all. Um, he was a Swansea accent. And I also recognised the man from BBC Wales. Well, I noticed another guy around and I said, see, yeah, I go over there, grey-haired guy with a woman. I said, he works at the bloody BBC in Cardiff, doesn't he? He said, yeah, he does. Uh -huh. Definitely, you know. With a sort of a wispy beard, much thinner man, smaller man. And they were, they were, he was playing the um, playing the romantic with a woman who wasn't his uh, affair. I love her. I checked that out subsequently. So when we were there, you'd be in the social evening and that. Him and his wife would be there, him and his wife there. They didn't know each other. Right? Right, yeah. So one day I see this guy coming out of this 
Shally thought is that him and his wife, the big guy, lived was right next door to us. Right. There about 50, 60 of these things. There's only two occupied, us and him right next door. Right. Anyway, uh, and I said, I just had that feeling, so I just walked quietly behind him. He said, right. he goes around now, and he went around the other side of the building, and who's he talking to but the one he doesn't know from the BBC. Right. So we're putting two and two together now. Uh-huh. Oh, I said, hey, there's something wrong here. And then they were pretending not to know each other. The, the military man from Swansea had a woman with him, which may have been his uh, missus or mm-hmm. his girlfriend or whatever. And they were pretending not to meet each other. And I met them, and we caught them having private meetings just outside the bar, hotel bar. So I thought, this is, this is most peculiar. Yeah. So it felt like a setup because they weren't shown that they, 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 they knew each other when they were in the bar. They That's were pretending right. to be strangers. All in and the then cafeteria. They to each other. But they were talking to each other around the corner, like quietly, right. about three in the afternoon. Right. So I told him. Well, I got a knife out of the cafeteria in my pocket. To get the <laughs> right. <laughs> what a nasty bit. Yeah. Furthermore, you had a, 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 a set of inadequate golf clubs. And I noticed a cattle prod among the golf clubs. I said, this is most peculiar, I thought. Because this guy had a golf bag with him, and he had five or six totally different clubs, all different sites. And right. one was a kiddies club, a ten-year-old to use. And I said, which course are you going to play then? And one day at the door. Oh, he said, I'll try all of them. I said, where have you been yesterday? Oh, I forget the name. He right. hadn't been anywhere. He could. His golf bag was a joke. You so know? The, the golf thing was a cover? Well, Possibly. He, well, if he was playing golf, he'd be, he'd be like Tom and Jerry. He'd know the name of the course. <laughs> hey? He'd know the name of the course. And his wife was a big, lumpy, tough character. She was no lady, I tell you that. One night in particular, it was a Saturday night again, we went out to um, the um, Marbella, Marbella the town. Mm-hmm. I'm almost sure it's Marbella. So this is one in detail in my diaries, yeah. going back to two, uh, 2004. I went to Marbella. And went in and had a meal and went in and went back for a way and went with a few drinks. Mm-hmm. We got a slightly drunk, not too drunk. Mm-hmm. And we got a taxi back. Got to arrive back at approximately one o'clock in the morning. Uh, a sort of a whitish doorway and there's these big old Spanish thick doors on these chalets. And um, there was a, a chair there, like a throne. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was, I, the, the timber of it was like three inches by three inches. Yeah. So it was okay. wow, really solid, bloody thing. Whacking big chair. So as you went through the door, the doorway was wide and you could, and it then went inwards like that. Mm-hmm. So the doorway's there and that's the, like the door cover I think and then the wall's like that. So he took the chair and he put it here against the wall at an angle against the door at night. Yeah. You, you just smelt a rat and you thought someone was maybe going to break into the room or to do something, so you barricaded the door with a big, heavy chair. Basically. A big, heavy Spanish chair. And it, it, one of these old style ones, about three inches in diameter. Around the, 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 it was, it's an ancient technique. The, the heavy chair was jammed between an alcove in the um, vestibule passageway, like a breeze block alcove, mm-hmm. and jammed tightly against the door mm-hmm. by two legs in approximately three inches diameter. Mm-hmm. So nobody could get in. No, an elephant couldn't get through there. Mm-hmm. And that's because you can't break timber that thick that way. You break it that way, perhaps, but you won't break it that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know, early hours of the morning, there was a hell of a bang. Right. And the room shook. I'm, huh? Ah, you right. know, I'm awake. Yeah. The whole villa shook. Literally shook as if you were shaking a budgie cage. Shake. Mm-hmm. Oh, the bed we got in the night. And there was another bump. So you must have and really suspected something not right if you're going to barricade your door. It's not something that's people right. normally do, is that's it? That's right. Right. That's right. You got that. So you got that. And then a few minutes later, I was, I was, I was, I must admit, I had a few drinks. I mean, what the hell is going on? Um, I think the mattress was put against it, and another go, and another bump. So, so you, so you, you suspected this noise was coming from your actual door. This, the, it was this definitely from your door. The building shake. Absolutely. Anyway, the door, nobody could get in. I said to Alan, our safety is in here, not going outside like fools. Right. So we remained so there. So there was the another next bang. Yeah, the next morning, there was another bang. So we went out the next morning, and the door had flake, pain flakes on the, on, on the um, concrete step. Right. You can see the pain flakes had been the, the force, first force. It was slight indentation. Okay. And the lock was forced, forced to be uh, maybe about three millimetres out of the. Um, right. And we noticed up around, I noticed up around the corner, you went around the corner, you were out of sight of the main, the office entrance, the 
the administrative block, right? You came down this white pathway uh, road, and the car park was that way, like an L. And this lane went into it like that, you know what I call it? So you were out of sight. And there was a van park there a couple of nights, which you couldn't quite see from the office, and right. you wouldn't see it from the lane. We had been killed in the in our villa. The, 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 their villa was within a few yards next door, through their door, mm-hmm. which and out the back window, with that, which didn't have bars, mm-hmm. very, very meticulously planned this, into a van. We would have been propping up a uh, Spanish, right. probably in the mountains, underneath a, a, a swimming pool or a, or, or a patio in some right. villa. It's conjecture. Yeah. But I think we'd have been whacked. We'd have been... Our chalets are that, it was there. We went into a chalet, our doors there, it was there, out through the window, into the lane, into the van, right. and gone. Now, this is round about. This the is all conjecture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's round about the time just before you published the discovery of the Ark. Is that's that right? right, that's right. Okay. And it's, I know for sure it's not a um, real government operation, it's underbelly scum. It's not, it's not state sanctioned, because I don't do, I'm, or basically, I'm just a mind of Alan Wilson. Mm-hmm. My interests are just rock music. Um, films and boxing. Mm-hmm. I don't do anything that 99% of the population don't do in <coughs> male. <coughs> so it's not state sanctioned. They want me out the way so they can get Alan Wilson. Mm-hmm. It's only explanation. And, and after the attempt, the Malaga attempt failed, and Dowdle, Gareth Dowdle was sacked within weeks of that. I've got the, you've got, you've got the email yeah. and the details. What's the matter? I can't get through this Newcastle bastard. Because they don't really want me, uh, by definition. They want to get rid of Alan Wilson's best ally.